Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Zio Education webinar series. My name is Judy Lanan, and I'm the Chief Clinical Officer at iRhythm, as well as also the EVP of Products and Clinical Research. And I'm your moderator for today's event. On behalf of iRhythm, I would like to welcome you to today's session titled, Could Screening for Silent AF Prevent Stroke? Joining me today are Dr. Jeff Healy, Senior Author of the Screen AF Study, Senior Scientist at the Population Health Research Institute, Professor of Medicine at McMaster University, and a founding member of the Canadian Stroke Prevention Intervention Network that supported this trial. And Dr. Rolf Wachter, co-principal investigator, cardiology, cardiologist at the University Hospital in Leipzig, Germany, and scientist at the German Center for Cardiovascular Research. Welcome to both of you, and thank you for joining us from Canada and Germany. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> Thanks. Recently, JAMA Cardiology published the latest AF screening research, the Screen AF study, as well as an accompanying editorial. We're excited for Dr. Healy and Dr. Wachter to review the details of the study with us and discuss the future for AF screening. Please note that in the AF, the Screen AF study, CL monitors were used solely for the purpose of clinical research and are not commercially available in Canada and Germany at this time. We hope to correct that. To start off, to start us off, Dr. Healy, could you please provide us a, a brief background and primary objective of the study? Sure, thank you, uh, Judy, and thanks everybody for joining. And uh, I'll just uh, take control of the slides. So, you know, Screen AF was really it's an investigator-initiated study, uh, joint venture between Canada and Germany, uh, and involved 48 centers uh, in between 2015 and 2019. And really, we were asking a few important questions to kind of set the stage for bigger work in stroke prevention via AF screening. We wanted to know if you could uh, deploy a strategy uh, and, and achieve screening in a large number of individuals with good tolerability. We wanted to pick a population that would have a, uh, a high enough uh, prevalence of atrial fibrillation to make things worthwhile. We wanted to kind of characterize how long those episodes were lasting. And most importantly, we wanted to show that screening uh, with an ECG-based device like the Zeopatch would lead to the initiation of anticoagulation. And these are really all the prerequisites that one needs uh, to develop a, a, a trial, a much bigger trial looking at strokes. So we had two groups. Uh, these were older patients with a uh, history of hypertension, and they had a control group where they got usual care, follow-up every six months with pulse check and auscultation by a physician. And in the screening group, we did uh, two zeo patches, two weeks each at baseline and at three months. And while the patients had the patch on, we also asked them to use one of these home blood pressure devices, which can measure for pulse irregularity and do that twice a day during that two week period. So having the simultaneous uh, non-ECG based method, intermittent method, uh, compared to the uh, Zeopatch and Rolf is gonna show you how that uh, turned out. Uh, so go to the next slide here. So as mentioned, we wanted to look at the detection, uh, what would be the prevalence of atrial fibrillation lasting at least five minutes on the Zeopatch or diagnosed uh, by one of these uh, checks with the blood pressure machine. And of course, uh, we did a comparison between the two since they were done at the same time. Anticoagulation use was key, right? If you find atrial fibrillation, but don't start anticoagulation, you're not gonna prevent strokes. So we wanted to measure anticoagulation use at six months, uh, both as a measure of how often it was started, but how well patients adhered and persisted with therapy. And we wanted to look at a host of other outcomes. So how well the patches were tolerated, how long the patients would wear, wear them for, and uh, what types of clinical events, understanding this was a relatively small trial. Uh, and uh, so, but we did collect data on stroke and TIA. And uh, this was all uh, centrally adjudicated. And without stealing uh, Rolf's part of the discussion, I'll just hand over uh, to Rolf to give you uh, the data that we found. Great. Thank you, Dr. Healy. And so what did the trial discover? There were certainly many surprising findings. Dr. Bachter, could you please share with us the results that you and Dr. David Glance Gladstone 
the study's principal investigator and stroke neurologist from Sunnybrook Health Scientists in Toronto. What did you discover? Yeah, Judy, I'm very happy to do this. Um, and um, so the, the primary endpoint was the detection of atrial fibrillation at six months. And um, we did find more atrial fibrillation with the bio patch than we did find with usual care. It's not like it's twofold or it's threefold, it's tenfold more atrial fibrillation. So just look at the numbers. The, uh, the participants were pretty equal in a, random, uh, uh, in a one-to-one randomization. So 434 in the one arm and 422 in the other, but we did find 23 cases of atrial fibrillation in the Zio arm and only two cases in the control group. So there is a difference of 4.8% and the an, an absolute difference of 4.8%, which means you have a number needed to screen, which is 21. So you have to do 21 uh, Zio patches instead of usual care to find one more case of atrial fibrillation. And uh, the second question, as uh, Jeff pointed out, was does this translate in a difference in treatment? Because we all know um, the detection of atrial fibrillation does not reduce, cannot reduce strokes. The strokes can only be reduced if you have a change in medical therapy. And uh, we did see that there were significantly more patients that had anticoagulation after six months. It was 4.1% in the Zio group, and it was 0.9% in the control group. And most of these indications were atrial fibrillation that was newly detected. So, I mean, this was a study done in with general practitioners. And I mean, I don't know how it's in, in, in Canada or in, in the US, but at least in Germany, sometimes general practitioners are very reluctant to use more medication and uh, to uh, start with, uh, with uh, anticoagulation. But in this study, this was the case. So you see some details here. Uh, I said we had 23 cases of atrial fibrillation, 20 of them were detected by the Zio patch. So one interesting finding is even two times for a screening for, for atrial fibrillation does not, uh, so four weeks in, uh, in general or in, in total, does not find all cases of atrial fibrillation. We had three cases of atrial fibrillation that were clinically detected outside of the Zio patch. So there is some atrial fibrillation that you do not find, but most of the atrial fibrillation you find with the Zio patch. Most of that is atrial fibrillation. We had only one case of atrial flutter. And most of the AF is paroxysmal. So 90% of the episodes are paroxysmal. I think this is, is very important. And it just shows you what, uh, what uh, uh, the, the, the magnitude of the, of the possibilities you have with the Zio patch. And the burden of AF was pretty high. So nearly all cases were more than one hour, 70% were more than six hours, and 15% had more than 24 hours of atrial fibrillation. So this is really substantial. This is really substantial because, for instance, if we look with implantable loop recorders, maybe we can discuss this later a little bit. Jeff has done some studies on that. Usually we find uh, not 15% of uh, episodes more than 24 hours. So I think the atrial fibrillation that we find, the duration, that is really something that is substantial. Yeah. And Rolf, in this study also, I think the duration, or maybe Jeff, the five minutes was also, I think, very unique to this study as well compared to other trials. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, five yeah. minutes was what was often used in the, uh, in the pacemaker trials, for example. Uh, sure. But, uh, you know, obviously the, the threshold for AF detection in, in, in intermittent monitoring in a couple of weeks is probably lower. And, and the fact, as Rolf said, we found episodes typically lasting many hours so it just speaks to the fact that these are significant and and do require anticoagulant great thanks let's go on so this is um i, I would say this is the central um picture um, of the publication um i want to uh, guide you through this so you see the first adhesive ecg patch and the second one and you just see the days on the x-axis um, when you look at the bars, you see the, the percentage of, or the, not the percentage, the number of new cases that were detected on the 
individual day. If you just look for the first patch, you can see um, it's not like you find all the atrial fibrillation on the days one, two, or three. It's rather continuous that even on day 10, you find new cases, three more cases on day 11. So it's something that is continuous. And you would even say, okay, the curve is not going to flatten. So if we would have done this at the beginning, not for 14 days, but for 28 days, we would have found more. In fact, we did it for 24, eight, uh, 24, uh, 28 days, but we just had a gap of three months be uh, between the first and the second patch. Uh, and you can see that even with the second patch, we find more cases of atrial fibrillation. Um, in the end, if you compare both, you can say approximately three quarters of the AF you find with the first patch and 25% you find with the, the second patch. But it's not like you can say, okay, it would have been enough just to do this for five days or seven days. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just something uh, that even is it worth to be done uh, with the second patch and the third and, and the fourth week. Sure, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Bachter, what about the additional arrhythmias that were detected? Um, maybe for both of our speakers, just your thoughts on those as well. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, atrial fibrillation was the most prominent. That is what we expected, and this is what we found. But um, we did find a substantial number of patients who had um, a V block of second degree or more that were in 3% of the patients. We had patients with pauses uh, larger than, longer than five seconds. Uh, in 0.9% of the patients, uh, patients with um, um, a low heart rate, so bradycardia below 40 and or higher than 160 were also some cases um, and no cases of ventricular tachycardia. Um, I mean, uh, I think we, we uh, also looked at the rates of pacemaker implantation that was pretty low. So this were just rare cases that really these patients needed uh, pacemakers. The most prominent finding by far was atrial fibrillation. Great. I, I hope I didn't uh, forget it, anything. It, it, yes. No, I mean, I think it just highlights when you monitor for extensive periods like that, you do need a system in place to pick up these things because, you know, many of these were actionable. Uh, the, you know, things were safe in the trial. We didn't have any adverse events as a result of this, but uh, it is important uh, to be on top of screening for this long because you will find things you didn't seek out to find in the first place. Going on, thank you, Dr. Bachter, for that. I think the um, one of the other questions, Dr. Healy, is you know you sure you shared that one of the objectives of the study is to understand the tolerability of the ZO monitor by patients. Is there more about this experience that our audience should understand? Yeah, sure. So as you mentioned, Judy, this was an older uh, population and in, in many ways a higher risk, but they 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 did tolerate mm -hmm. the monitoring extremely well, right? 96% completed the first two weeks, around 80% for the second two-week study, and adverse events were, were very low, you know, so skin reactions that required them to stop around 1%, and, uh, and most people agreed that the, the patch was quite tolerable and didn't really interfere with their daily activities at all, so uh, it was really, uh, it was well done, and we were actually pleasantly surprised how well people were for the two periods. Um, so in terms of clinical outcomes, as I mentioned, you know, it's a, it's, you know, it's, it's a big study, but it's still, you know, for a short-term follow-up of six months. And there is uh, some plan to go on and monitor uh, uh, these uh, study participants in the longer term, uh, but, you know, really just a handful of uh, clinical events, strokes, uh, and really uh, too few to make any kind of judgment about uh, the effectiveness of screening here for this trial. Although, as we'll allude to in the question period, uh, you know, many trials with similar designs uh, will come forward uh, there, and there is a, an international plan to pool uh, these trial results together in a big uh, right. uh, patient level meta-analysis. So uh, that's, that's about all to say about outcomes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you both for the, the meaningful overview of the study. Let's shift gears um, now and I'd like us to dive a little deeper into the notion of screening. Dr. Wachter, you're a practicing cardiologist in Germany and a co-PI in the trial. Based on your learning from the study, have you or will you change the way that you practice? So, uh, you know, um, 
one thing that that really is a pity is that we don't have the device in Germany. So it's not we ha we have in Germany a system where you we we do probably most of the valve procedures, interventional valve procedures in the world, because that is very well reimbursed. But for ambulatory screening, we don't have a very good um, a reimbursement system, and that is what hampers us. I mean, uh, that is, but that's more more a political thing. Um, I think for me, it just shows me that. Um, Screening for atrial fibrillation as a um, as a strategy to reduce uh, strokes is something that we just should go further uh, and that we should do more. And just to to remind everybody, I, I would say this is a, a very high risk population. It's just seventy five years of age and uh, a history of hypertension. That's all that you had to 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 have to come into the trial. Um, so um, that is one thing that I think about. And the second thing is um, we better have to understand who in this population benefits most from screening. So um, what additional things can we, we do? I, I mean, I would like to see data on, on echo, but that is not possible in the GP population. Sure. Maybe biomarkers can play a role. The, um, there were some colleagues in Sweden who do a lot with natriuretic peptides, and we will do an a sub analysis in screen AF for that as well. So, to better understand in this large population of 75 years and eight or older with hypertension, can we better predefine the best risk population? This is what I learned from this data. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Dr. Healy, you're an electrophysiologist. Do you have a similar approach to Dr. Vachter, or are there different considerations that you have? No, I, I think it's a, a matter of finding a population that's at higher, high enough risk of both atrial fibrillation and stroke. And fortunately, the two, uh, the two risk factors tend to go together. So predictors of stroke are indeed the predictors of atrial fibrillation in most cases. Yeah. I, I think to uh, you know, kind of loop this into one of the questions I see here online, I think it's important that you know, screening not occur in a vacuum. So although you know, direct-to-consumer does work, and certainly there are a lot of consumer-facing electronics out there now for AF diagnosis, this exists already, um, I think it's important if we are going to demonstrate an effect on stroke that there is you know, somehow integration and linkage to healthcare delivery. Uh, and we see this when we do screening in the population versus screening in family practice, you know, in this stroke stop study or this uh, screen AF study, pardon me, uh, we've got very <laughs> high rates of anticoagulant and this doesn't necessarily happen. You know, we had a large Canadian pharmacy study, for example, and the stroke, uh, the uh, rates of anticoagulation use were far uh, lower. So I think, you know, screening does have to uh, take place in, in some type of setup where the results can be translated. Because as I said, uh, if you detect AFib, that's wonderful, but that's step one on the path towards stroke prevention. And if you don't have those linkages, it doesn't work uh, to prevent stroke. Thank you. Thank you both. I, I think, you know, in the study, screen was performed in primary care offices. Some, there's been some concern that screening AF may be too complex for primary care levels. And I think Dr. Healy, what you were just referring to, um, about the need for a pathway or care. Um, where should AF screening be conducted in the future? Well, I mean, I think it, it, it probably depends where you live, uh, what your healthcare system is. Uh, I think all of the different settings could work, right? A patient-centered home screening uh, at a population level could work. And we've seen some interesting data from StrokeStop, which I'll, I'll pause to discuss uh, in a few minutes. Um, it, it, you know, integrated with primary care, you know, more of this opportunistic case finding. Uh, and then there's, you know, other points of contact, whether they're pharmacies or community centers or whatever. So I think they can all work. It's just a matter of demonstrating that you can deliver it. I mean, but I think uh, all of these have potential. Unfortunately, uh, right now, there are somewhere between two and 300,000 patients in randomized trials around the world in a variety of these different settings using different tools, different inclusion criteria and different methods of healthcare delivery. And uh, like I said, when we uh, are able to summarize all of this experience, I think we'll, we'll see uh, that, uh, you know, there's different things that work in different places. That's, that's great. Dr. Bachter. Yeah, um, um, I, 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 I agree. Uh, but I would say that uh, at least in, in screen AF, we could show that uh, in the GP practices, at least in Canada and in Germany, it did work pretty well. And I mean, it worked similarly in both um, 
and it's it's different um, it's different healthcare systems, but it was there was no difference in the efficacy in finding atrial fibrillation. Um, so I think that is one possibility um, how we could move forward. And um, and I think uh, if we think about cardiovascular prevention, that is something that can easily be done. I mean, it's just just the patch. So the patch has to be put on the patient's chest. That is something that the patient could do on his own, but definitely that can be done by a nurse in a GP office after some very brief training. And then after two weeks, it's just removed, it's sent in and you get a report and then the GP has to react on this. I, I wouldn't say this is too complicated. Great, great. Well, thank you. And I think from my perspective as a clinician, it's we need many shots on goal to steal a hockey. <laughs> a hockey for our Canadian and German <laughs> colleagues, but really, you know, this idea that ECG monitoring, is it a fit vital sign? Should it be opportunistic? Should we be targeting high-risk populations? Should we be using EHR to really try to find folks who need it? I think those are all, you know, future avenues for us as we try to tackle, tackle this and really understand how to, how to identify those patients who we can help. With that, we're now going to open up to our audience questions. Um, for our viewers, please use the Q&A button on your screen to submit questions. And it looks like we've got quite a few coming in. So here's what, our first question. So would the panelists support access to this test for consumers without a prescription from a doctor? Yeah, like I, like I said earlier, I mean, I, I think we're already there with other types of ECG-based monitoring direct to consumers. So I, I don't think it's a very far leap. I think if you're looking at this from the lens of, uh, you know, USPSTF or other groups, I, I think you, you would prefer this to be kind of integrated uh, with some type of healthcare delivery. But, uh, uh, you know, from the physician groups, certainly in Canada, uh, you know, there's the issue of reimbursement. Of course, there is no reimbursement in this country for uh, things that are initiated by patients. And, and this, uh, this will definitely uh, you know, cause some issue, but um, you know, I don't think this is a far leap from what is uh, being done already. It's just a matter of is it is it a is it useful on a personal level? Perhaps is it a uh, you know the best strategy for you know population based stroke reduction? Uh, I would argue that uh, it does need to be linked in with healthcare delivery better. But uh, see what Dr. Vachter says about that. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think it's it's something that uh, that consumers can use. Uh, what I think is important is that there is some linkage to a doctor. I mean, at least the dis uh, results have to be discussed with the doctor. I mean, we don't want that the patients start a treatment on their own. So um, you need a doctor somewhere to 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 initiate the results, uh, to initiate the um, um, anticoagulation, or to draw other con conclusions. And I mean, if you do it with GPs, you also need somewhere a cardiologist in the loop. So we had a lot of questions from the GPs that they were asking us then, okay, but now the question to you, should I now start anticoagulation and what should I do with this pause of uh, three seconds at night? So you need, uh, you need physicians somewhere in the loop. And so you, it, it probably would not be wise just to say, okay, now the Zio patch is on market in Germany. Everybody can buy it for a certain price. Um, and then you don't know what, what really happens and uh, um, you need some physicians somewhere integrated yeah thank you for that yeah it, it is important to get the buy-in yeah i was going to say it is important to get the buy-in we found this in the pharmacy studies that whenever the physicians were kind of sideswiped with the results they were less willing to deliver anticoagulant therapy than if they had been involved with the uh, the process in our, in our other so uh, i think it is an important consideration yeah i believe me from our perspective the part of that question was what is you know i rhythms perspective and again i think we feel very strongly that the physicians need to be involved in this process um and even if it was a over-the-counter where are the physicians where is that care pathway to ensure that the whole context of that patient's journey is really totally assessed um so great let's move on to our second question which came about uh, the stroke stop was just released over the weekend. Um, what about the new studies? How will they relate to this 
um, clinical evidence that's being built around uh, screening for, a, a, you know, for subclinical AF. Dr. Healy, do you want to start? Yeah, so, yeah, so I mean, stroke stock was very large, right? 28,000 people, so uh, many times larger than the uh, uh, Screen AF study. Uh, powered for clinical events, they got a, a, a victory, a borderline p-value, but significant, about a 5% reduction in their composite, which included stroke, uh, but also included things like bleeding and all-cause mortality. Uh, th there's going to be some very interesting additional analyses looking at on treatment uh, because they did have a, um, uh, a significant number of people that didn't go through with the screening, which was twice daily handheld ECGs for two weeks. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll get a, a look at that and, and specifically we're most interested in looking at the on-treatment effect for ischemic stroke alone as an outcome. But, uh, you know, stroke stop definitely takes it a step further, right? It's longer term, huge numbers by previous comparison with clinical endpoints. Uh, but again, I think we have many additional trials on the way over the next three to four years. And I think we'll really need the totality of those uh, data uh, to really drive, uh, drive the, uh, the change in some countries in terms of screening guidelines. Uh, but, you right. know, this is, uh, this is very, this is a step forward, you know, a big step forward uh, with demonstration yeah. of some clinical outcomes. That's great. Great. Thank you. Dr. Vachter, anything else to, to add? Yeah, just one point to add. Um, most of the cases that we detect in, um, in um, screen AF or that stop stroke detects these are patients that have net not been included in the large anticoagulation trial mm. because um, this is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, um, but not with an um, with a surface ECG, but with other means. And so it's not clear at the moment whether these patients benefit similarly. And we don't know, for instance, what is the the cutoff. As as the Dr. Healy mentioned, maybe the cutoff of atrial fibrillation that is actionable is different when I do a monitoring for only two weeks in comparison to I do a monitoring continuously. Or on the other hand, as in the stop stroke study, they did a thumb ECG two times per day, but only for 30 seconds if I'm, I'm informed correctly yes. and did this for two weeks. So this, okay. this means if you would do in parallel continuous monitoring uh, the, the Zio patch and the thumb ECGs two times a day, uh, just for two weeks, you would say, okay, this thumb ECG, they will just detect the, the, the tip of the iceberg. And the, to, to, uh, uh, to treat this, I think that is pretty, pretty clear. If you do the uh, Zio patch and you have an episode of, let's say three or six hours, you probably would have missed this episode with the, with the mm -hmm. thumb ECG. So it's, mm -hmm. do they have the same benefit from anticoagulation? We don't know. If you put in an, um, a continuous monitor and say, okay, I find 10% or 12 or 15% of atrial fibrillation within one year, I find the first episodes, let's say after three months or so, that is even another population. And for all these populations, we need to know, okay, what is the benefit um, of anticoagulation? Jeff, for instance, is doing an important trial that is close to having finished enrollment in patients who have short episodes of atrial fibrillation of I think six minutes is the is the, um, the the lower limit, and to see do these patients benefit from anticoagulation? Do all of them benefit, or is it only maybe a subgroup of them? So I think there is um, still a lot of work to do, but the evidence is coming more and more. If we find atrial fibrillation of five minutes, 10 minutes, or an hour or more with only short-term monitoring of two weeks, then probably this is actionable. I think that is what most people would agree on at the moment, but the randomized data is, is, is lacking uh, and we need more to better understand this. Absolutely, which is a perfect segue into our next question, which is, do you feel the, the studies that are coming out, screen AF included, stroke stops, will change the opinion of the level of evidence required for screening of the United States Prevention Services Task Force. Dr. Healy. Yeah, certainly, like? uh, yeah, <laughs> certainly there will be, uh, you know, some correspondence from uh, AF Screen, the organization and the Stroke Stop Investigators to the SPSTF in response to their uh, recent guidelines, which still 
uh, give population-based screening and incomplete. And I think it's important to stress, you know, what they're talking about is population-based. This is not opportunistic screening when a patient's in your office because of a blood pressure check or something. We're talking population levels. So I think there's general traction around the issue of uh, opportunistic uh, case finding, if you will. Um, definitely it'll change. Uh, will it turn the course, the single stroke stop study? I'm not sure it will, uh, but it, it, it's, it's the start, right? And, and again, there are many other studies out there, slightly different populations and screening methodologies. And again, there's uh, the AF screen. One thing the group will do is a, a big uh, patient level meta-analysis and meta-regression of 200,000 plus patients in randomized trials. And I think that somewhere along the pathway between now and three to four years, the, there yeah. uh, will be compelling evidence one way or another if we can drive the needle on stroke reduction. I hope is we can. And uh, I think stroke stop is a, is a teaser that I think uh, we're on the right track. Great. But I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic. That's great. That's great to hear. Dr. Bachter, any thoughts? Um, no, I, um, I, I, I think I agree. So um, there is more to come, but at the moment, the, the evidence that is coming um, is, is really supportive of to do more screening, not, not on a population level. I don't think right. that this is the adequate way, but in, in risk populations that we have to better understand. Um, but I mean that, that this, this really could be a success study for cardiovascular prevention. We, I mean, if you, if you compare this to other areas, if you, if you look for the, um, the, the use of colonoscopy for, for colon cancer, and, and you look at the number needed to screen and to treat, you don't have any effect, for instance, on total mortality. Uh, you do not prolong life, but we are doing this, at least in Germany, and I know in other, many other countries. And I think the uh, screening for atrial fibrillation in special risk population, that is really something that could be a good a goal for cardiovascular prevention, because stroke is the most feared cardiovascular disease. Patients do fear strokes more than they fear myocardial infarction, or then they, uh, they don't fear cardiovascular death. They say, I want to die of cardiovascular death, just just, just very quick and, and it's over. And, and, I, and I think, so there will be a lot of willingness by the patients to, to use such uh, screening methods, even if they are not very complicated, if they are not harmful, if, they, uh, if you can do all your daily duties, you just have to wear this for, let's say two weeks, once a year mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, what I also think uh, we, we should think more about is this is all short term. And it's just, we do this once and we do it again after three months. What about doing this, let's say for four or five years and then look at the, event, uh, the effects. We, if we do a trial mm -hmm. with, with the pharmacotherapy, we usually do this for two or three years continuously. Here with screening, we just say we do it, uh, we do it once or we do it twice and then we look for the, for the follow-up. I mean, there's a lot of interest in who is going to develop atrial fibrillation, which atrial fibrillation is is staying at the same level, is staying mm -hmm. at, let's say, a few minutes, on which atrial fibrillation is just getting longer. So from, from Jeff's uh, data from the ESER trial, from continuous monitoring, we know that patients who have short episodes of atrial fibrillation that get longer are those who have a high risk of, uh, of strokes. And we better have to understand uh, what not only who is getting atrial fibrillation, but also to understand which of the atrial fibrillation that has the highest risk to uh, develop stroke. That's probably not all only burden or duration of atrial fibrillation, but other factors like what's going on in the left atrium, what is going on in the, uh, with the natriuretic, uh, natriuretic, uh, mm -hmm. with the uh, natriuretic peptides in these patients, all these things. So if there's a lot of, to learn. Yeah, the, the, other, the other piece of it, Rolf, I mean, I, I think the acceptability of screening for atrial fibrillation, again, this highlights the importance of tie-in to medical care delivery. It, it gets broader and the economics look more attractive when you consider more than just anticoagulation, right? So atrial fibrillation, we're much more interested in risk factors. We know that silent or subclinical atrial fibrillation predicts not only stroke, but is a very strong predictor of heart failure. And we know, for example, from some of the work like, uh, like our study, uh, for example, in patients with screen-detected atrial fibrillation, the average systolic blood pressure is 140 millimeters of mercury, or the median nice. value, actually. So, you know, half the patients we're finding with screen-detected atrial fibrillation have poorly controlled blood pressure. And, you know, blood pressure 
reduction is also a very effective proven way of reducing stroke and other outcomes. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so if it's part of a holistic kind of package of, you know, you identify atrial fibrillation, yes, anticoagulation first and foremost, but what's the blood pressure? Does the patient have undiagnosed, untreated sleep apnea? Uh, Are they smoking? Do they have diabetes? You know, the typical Mm -hmm. package of risk factors, you know, we need to start thinking of atrial fibrillation in the same way we think about coronary artery disease and not just in terms of, you know, ablation and, and, uh, and anticoagulation. So I, I think when you take that broader lens on atrial fibrillation detection, uh, the, uh, the opportunity gets greater, uh, but then the need to be tied into, uh, you know, some solid healthcare delivery gets greater as well. Thank you, Jeff. That's fantastic. Giving us broadening out our view. Um, but I'm going to bring us back to the screen AF study. There was one question about, you know, in the patients with less than five minute duration of AF, but a high burden, you know, were there patients? And if so, what actions were taken for those patients? So again, less than five minutes, which was the standard for AF definition in the study, but a high burden. And were there yeah, any other those- Yeah, fortunately, those patients were relatively uncommon. I mean, the various trials that look at this, you know, you can only cut it so so many ways. And, you know, we've often used a threshold value rather than saying, let's add it all up. Uh, Not an issue, not as big an issue or not an issue really at all for the Zeopatch. But when you're talking about things like implantable loop monitors and implantable pacemakers, uh, the reason we avoid this uh, adding up of small episodes is because at, at very short durations, the positive predictive value, the specificity of these episodes goes down, right? So in, in a CERT, for example, if you went under five minutes, only about half of the episodes that were sta- detected by the device at less than five minutes were actually atrial fibrillation. And so, you know, uh, this is a, a positive for uh, patches like Zeo patch to because they have nice ECG, but you, you know, all, all types of detection will lose some specificity when you get to extremely short episodes. And uh, again, but those patients that, you know, we just didn't really have a lot of patients that had hundreds of two minute episodes, but nothing greater than five minutes. Uh, you know, it, it's a relatively frequent uh, occurrence in these types of studies. That's, that's actually great to hear. Cause I think clinically people worry about, well, what do I do with a little bit of AF that I find? Yeah, so that's, this is great. Well, I think we're, we're at our time. Actually, we've gone over with all the great questions. So thank you. On behalf of iRhythm, I, I'd like to thank Dr. Healy, Dr. Wachter, once again, for spending time with us today and sharing their insights on this pivotal study. We'd also like to thank the audience for tuning in. Um, the webinar recording will be available shortly on the iRhythm website. Um, And again, to stay updated about future webinars, education sessions, you can follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn. This concludes our webinar for today. Thank you once again for tuning in to the Zio Education webinar and see you next time and take care and stay well. Thank you.